Good morning. Um, so as Kate said, I'm going to be talking about E. coli 0157H7 shedding in cattle, uh, in particular in, in beef cattle. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give a little bit of a, a background on 0157H7, uh, talk a little bit about shedding and super shedding of this pathogen in cattle, and then talk about, give a little bit of an overview about a collaborative study that be, we've been working on and then focus uh, on a recent, a recent part of that study that we've, we've undertaken. Uh, so E. coli are a part, a common part of the normal flora in many animals and in particular in cattle. Uh, most strains don't cause disease uh, in humans and indeed uh, most strains, if not all strains, uh, don't cause disease commonly at least in the animals that they're within and in particular in cattle. Uh, however, some of these strains do cause disease in humans in particular. Uh, and they are commonly referred to as shigatoxin producing E. coli or STEX, and a subset of those that cause enterohemorrhagic disease or, or severe gastrointestinal disease in humans are called enterohemorrhagic E. coli or EHEX. Uh, e. coli 0157H7, which is the pathogen that I'm going to be talking about today, is the prototype EHEC serotype. It's the most commonly identified EHEC serotype worldwide and is most commonly associated with human disease. There are other EHEC serotypes and they're ca called or have been termed the big six and that is E. coli 026, 045, 01, 03, 0111, 0121 and 0145. Now 026 might um, potentially ring a bell or it may not uh, but this was the serotype that was associated uh, with a large outbreak of foodborne disease in Europe that um, infected many, many hundreds of people um, and killed many people as well just, just a couple of years ago. Um, but the point of the fact is uh, these particular EHEX do cause severe disease in humans um, and importantly, and we'll come on to talking a little bit about what, what we need to do to try to, to help this, but the USA in particular has required port of entry testing uh, for E. coli 0157H7 uh, since 2002 and also uh, for the big six since 2012. So, so they see it as a, as a major problem. With respect to disease in humans that is caused by, by 0157H7, um, it's commonly identified in outbreak investigations where we see foodborne disease. Uh, it results in severe, uh, severe stomach cramps, diarrhoea, which is often, often hemorrhagic, um, and vomiting, and it has an incubation period that ranges from one to 10 days. Um, now, very importantly, and I guess moving from the, from the human to uh, what we're really here to talk about today, which is not necessarily at all human disease, um, what we need to uh, remember here is that the minimum infectious dose is as low as 10 bacteria. Um, so for things like Salmonella and Campylobacter, which are, are again also common um, uh, foodborne diseases in humans, you need many more bacteria to, to result in the disease. But for E. coli 0157H7, in particular in the other EHEX, uh, you have a very, very low minimum infective dose. Uh, so we start to uh, see problems um, when we have any sort of contamination of food products. Um, very importantly, and I guess uh, we'll come on to why this is so important, but, but a few of these cases that occur in humans, so 5 to 10% of the cases uh, can progress to a very severe systemic disease which is called hemolytic uremic syndrome um, which results in hemolysis and renal failure and, and can commonly uh, uh, result also in death which is clearly a severe sequelae. Um, very young children and the elderly are more likely to develop HUS um, and it's, it's very concerning. So what are the potential exposures for I157H7? Uh, well, it's predominantly contaminated food and non-disinfected water, uh, but also contact with the faeces of infected people and contact with cattle to begin with, um, in, in addition to just contact with, with contaminated foods such as beef. Um, and there are also uh, recreational exposures such as swimming um, and kayaking and things like that in con contaminated water. High-risk foods include unpasteurised milk, 
um, soft cheeses that are made from that raw milk, unpasteurised apple cider, um, undercooked hamburger or undercooked or poorly cooked meat and contaminated vegetables. But basically the bottom line is that all of these uh, potential high risk foods come back to the source of, of animal faeces. Uh, and if we don't have uh, an animal faecal contamination, then we, we don't get a problem. In terms of incidence by country of uh, STEC cases in humans, what we can see here is that there's a vast variation. Now this is cases per 100,000 population and uh, they vary between average cases over a number of years per 100,000 and, and yearly estimates. But what we can see is the highest incidence is found uh, in European countries such as Scotland and Ireland where we get 4.3 cases per 100,000 and if we move down our list we find that Australia, although South Australia with 0157 and <coughs> EHEX in general or STEX in general are uh, much greater, the incidence in Australia overall uh, certainly for 2010 which is the last lot of data that has been published by the Oz Food Net is incredibly low and, and much lower than, than the rest of these. So why are we worried about this? Well, we're worried about it because of the severity of the disease that results and also because of the point of entry testing that the USA imposes on Australia. Um, now Australia may be behind the rest of the world in terms of increasing the incidence of this disease in terms of uh, prevalence or incidence within our population, um, but we're not so sure about that. We, we know that um, the, the incidence is quite low in Australia. So what do we know about E. coli R157H7 shedding in cattle? And, and really we need to consider shedding of this pathogen in animals because of course this is the, the whole uh, source of the disease process whether, whether people end up getting it from contaminated meat or vegetables. We know that there is variation between herds. We know that most, if not all, farms and feedlots have positive animals at some point in time and that is in Australia and elsewhere. Estimates of prevalence of 0157 shedding in Australia uh, range from 1.9 to 15% of animals. And there have been a number of studies that have identified factors associated with 0157 carriage in cattle in general. Um, and these include age, so younger animals are more likely to carry and shed 0157. Uh, diet, the, there have been a number of conflicting reports about diet, but it seems that those animals fed on uh, a grain as opposed to a grass fed diet are more likely to carry and shed 0157 season. Uh, there are more, m uh, animals are more likely to shed 0157 during the summer months and certainly the uh, likelihood of humans, uh, humans contracting 0157 and being hospitalised with, uh, with the disease that results is more likely during the summer months. Day length, increased day length associated with uh, increased shedding, group housing and transport. So we know that there are a number of risk factors. Um, the ability for us to control some of these is obviously a little bit tricky, particularly when we're talking about uh, season and, and day length. But we do know that there are some associations. Okay, Jane, quickly, would it be fair to say that it's just um, animals that are under more greater stress are more likely to shed? Uh, potentially, uh, that's certainly going to be a contributing factor, um, but it's not necessarily the, the, the entire factor. Things like day length and, and, um, uh, and season shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily come to, you know, be just uh, associated with stress. There's, but it, it's fair to say it's multifactorial, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we also know, uh, or what we have also found out in recent years, is that there's, there's actually variation or a marked variation between animals as well with respect to shedding of this pathogen. Um, and there's a marked effect of the individual animal on the overall prevalence of shedding of 0157. What we know is that relatively few cattle are responsible for the majority of E. coli 0157 that are shed. So uh, a study by Matthews and colleagues uh, a number of years ago now, so in 2006, defined this very, very nicely. Um, and this is a, a, a graph of uh, the number of pathogens shed by cattle shedding 0157. And what we can see here is we've got uh, up to 400 animals that are, that are shedding the pathogen. And by far the majority, most of these animals shed at an incredibly low level, less than 100 colony forming units per gram. But when we get up to a few at the very top end here, we see that very few shed markedly higher numbers of this pathogen. And that's potentially very important. What we term this as is supershedding. 
And super shedding can be defined as when an animal sheds the pathogen at a markedly higher level and in particular greater than 10 to the power of 3 CFU per gram. In some studies, some studies have, have identified it as 10 to the power of 4. Needless to say, it's at a, it's a, a, a much higher level than the average level of shedding within the herd. What we know that if we have a super shedder in our herd, it acts as a risk factor for increased herd level faecal prevalence. So not just uh, faecal increased prevalence um, in those animals around them, but, but in general within the herd, uh, increased hide prevalence and hide load of E. coli 0157. So the presence of a super shedder within a herd is potentially incredibly important with respect to uh, the pathogen in the herd in general. But that's about as much as we know at this stage. There's a lack of longitudinal studies to track the within animal variation in shedding and super shedding or quantity of the pathogen shed. So we don't know if a single animal acts as a super shedder for life or whether all animals at some stage are capable of super shedding the pathogen. We also don't know which factors, if any, contribute to the development of shedding in general and also to the occurrence of a super shedding event in these types of situations. So that led us to, uh, to apply for a project and we have been uh, successful in obtaining a project, project collaboratively with the University of Sydney uh, and funded by Meat and Livestock Australia, looking into E. coli 157 colonisation and shedding in cattle. So the time frame for this project is over four years. We started in 2011 and it will run until mid-2015. And these are the three broad aims of the project. We wanted to review the available microbiological techniques for detection. Now, I haven't gone over that very uh, at all, but the, uh, the methods for detection are, are very difficult to use and certainly not standardised. Um, not only for detection, but also for quantification. Um, incredibly difficult uh, historically to do and requiring uh, a number of different types of techniques. So we wanted to identify effective and efficient detection methodology that could be used uh, in a number of different environments so that we could not only detect shedding, not only quantify shedding, but compare it appropriately between different sites. And ultimately we wanted to estimate the frequency of occurrence and the predictors of shedding and super shedding uh, in two production systems, um, both in uh, beef production and also in a dairy system. So this is the project, um, this is the outline of the project. So it's in uh, seven steps. We needed an initial literature review, technical training and pilot study, laboratory skill validation across a number of sites, um, a longitudinal study to look at how shedding and super shedding varied in animals over time, um, an expert opinion exercise, simulation modelling and a national forum, which I'll come on to soon. Now, what I'm going to focus on today, and just very briefly, is the longitudinal study, which is where we're currently up to and just currently completing. Um, and what this study was undertaken with the aim of doing was to look at the individual and population transmission dynamics of E. coli 0157H7 and to identify and quantify risk factors for shedding and, importantly, for super shedding. We did this by undertaking fieldwork. So fieldwork was undertaken between October 2012 and June 2013, so it finished a, a couple of months ago. And what we did was, under MLA's um, uh, instruction, was to look at a single herd of 23 grass-fed Herefords, so just looking at a single herd, but incredibly intensively. Um, so within this herd, what we did is we sampled them twice a week um, and for each animal, we obtained a rectal grab sample and also a rectoanal mucosal junction swab. Um, and we obtained information about whether or not E. coli 0157H7 was present. And if it was, we quantified uh, the, the number of, of, uh, of units of pathogen shed per gram. In addition to this, what we obtained uh, were individual variables, uh, in, uh, variables associated with individual animals, such as individual rectal temperature, faecal consistency on a, um, a, a, a scale uh, of, of one to four, hide contamination again uh, on an ordinal scale, uh, the weight of the animal, the body condition score and faecal cortisol levels. We also at each point in time that we sampled uh, obtained environmental variables, information on the environmental variables such as rainfall, temperature, daylight duration, humidity, hours of sunshine, pasture type, quality, quantity and whether or not contamination of the drinking water uh, that the herd was using uh, was present or not. 
our outcome variable, we did have two outcome variables, uh, which is whether the animals were shedding, yes or no, and also the quantity of the pathogen shed, but I'll come on to that again in a minute. So what we found descriptively was that out of 1,326 samples, and remembering um, each time we uh, sample our, our cattle, it takes uh, two to five days to process those samples by the time we, uh, we uh, obtain uh, estimates and uh, quantify those, uh, those isolates as well. We found that 172 of these, so that is 13% of our uh, samples were positive. Now this corresponds fairly well with what the, what the literature says, although as I said there's a large variation in the literature, but this isn't, this isn't unusual. Um, of those, we found that 152 of those, so that is 88%, were shedding at very low levels, so less than 10 to the power of 2 CFU per gram. Now those levels were only able to be detected by the use of immunomagnetic separation, um, and in many uh, studies that have been published previously, that has not been used, and, and, and they're the studies that relate low um, prevalence of, of this pathogen on herd. 10 of our samples uh, were shedding between 10 to the power of 2 and 10 to the power of 3 uh, CFU per gram, and only 10 shed at a level that would be defined as a super shedder. Okay, so only 10 shed at greater than 10 to the power of 3 CFU per gram, which was great in one sense and slightly disappointing in another. Um, so in terms of what we saw, in terms of the pattern, what we found was um, our animals varied quite dramatically in terms of when they shed over time. If we have a look at um, the <coughs> cow settled for second from the top there, G54, we can see that this cow only shed on two occasions over the eight month period. Whereas if we come down to another cow such as D5, we can see that it shed on a number of occasions during our eight month period. And there were also occasions, and particularly when we started the study, um, for rather a long time when no shedding occurred and we were, um, my, certainly my PhD student was uh, pretty close to throwing the towel in, but I'm glad that she didn't because uh, over the, the six months that ensued, ensued we got rather, rather a number. But you can see that there are a number of occasions such as here, um, back here, and then a few points in time along the way where very, very minimal amounts of shedding were occurring at all. If we overlie our super shedders on this, what we can see that, again, very small numbers, um, but they're peppered within the herd. Um, they're occurring all uh, in the earlier sort of time frame of the study, um, and very few of them, so there's three animals that uh, super shed on more than one occasion, and two that super shed only on a single occasion, which is interesting to note. Unfortunately, because we had so few super shedders, we couldn't then go ahead and do uh, our analyses looking at the uh, risk factors for super shedding. So what we did was just looked at risk factors for shedding in a longitudinal sense, which again has not been performed before. And what we found was that faecal consistency uh, has appeared to have a, an effect in this herd on, fecal, uh, on, on shedding of 0157. So as the faecal consistency increased, uh, the likelihood of shedding reduced. Um, also, uh, cows with a calf at foot were more likely to shed the pathogen. Uh, pasture quantity, as the pasture quantity increased, uh, the likelihood of shedding 0157 reduced, which is interesting then comparing with rainfall in the previous week, because as rainfall increased, uh, the likelihood of shedding also increased. Now, these study uh, findings are interesting, and what I think we need to remember is that we're doing this study in a single herd, albeit over a long period of time, and we have very, very many samples. And the other thing that we need to remember is that we're in Wagga, and we're in Wagga starting this, um, starting this study in October. So we actually didn't get rainfall for a very long period of time, a very, very long period of time. So the number of rainfall events were fairly small over this eight month period. And in addition, we also see a peak <coughs> of shedding um, if we were to stop the study in, at this point in time, which is actually quite a long period of time, it's still uh, six months of the study, we would find a very strong association between day length and shedding of the pathogen because this happens to be around the time of mid to late December and early January and of course day length peaks at that point in time and we would then have supported previous studies very, very well. But because we then came ahead and had another uh, few waves of shedding uh, that 
uh, association dropped out. So what we need to think about is what has affected previous studies previously uh, and has that affected our study and what are we actually finding here that can be of any use. Question. Sorry. You're sort of saying, you know, day length. I mean, if you're saying it's late January, February, is that that's one about heat wave time? Absolutely, and and temperature temperature so as well. Was so that even looked at? absolutely, temperature was looked at, and initially uh, it depends where you. And this is the interesting thing about doing a longitudinal study over a period of time. So depending on where you stop that study, we can make day length become significant and a significant predictor and we can make temperature become a significant predictor. But the issue with temperature is that again in this last period it was actually quite hot for a long period of time right into to March and so that effect was not nearly as, as great as, as day length. Yeah, well, I think just because of the, just, just the way that the data were collected. So realistically, a study like this really needs to be performed in multiple sites over multiple years. And we need to repeat this study over the next two or three years to enable us to make any, any hard and fast uh, 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 inference from this. Um, but the issue is, is that it's incredibly expensive. It's about $1,000 a week to collect these data. It's incredibly labour intensive and it's incredibly uh, expensive to, to actually uh, appropriately uh, use the, the systems that we need to use, so immunomagnetic separation and the, and the, and the plating out. So uh, it becomes difficult and that's why these longitudinal studies haven't been done before. Uh, so it's a great uh, addition to the literature to have this, but we need to remember that it's in uh, a single environment over a length of time. So, so breed it's specific as well. absolutely breed specific and and um, pr and production system specific, obviously, obviously. Um, so it is the first study to look at change in shedding in animals over a prolonged period of time, and we found that faecal consistency, nursing, <coughs> rainfall, and pasture quantity are the four main factors that that drove um, shedding in this model. But this was also found to be different to uh, the dairy herd that the same study was done in Sydney. Um, and in that herd, they found that there were no particular predictors uh, with respect to shedding or super shedding. And it was not necessarily random, but almost seen as a random effect, or a random event in that herd. When we take a broader look at our model and we look just at the effects of day-to-day -day variability versus cow-to-cow -cow variability, what we find is that day-to-day -day variability, so that is on each point of sampling, has a greater effect than cow-to-cow -cow variability on shedding. So what that means is that shedding is not necessarily more likely to occur in one individual than another, which is an incredibly interesting finding. If we were able to extrapolate that finding, which we can't at this point, but we will try to do with, with further studies. If we were able to extrapolate this finding for super shedding as well, then it would support the fact that we should look to control super shedding events rather than looking for specific animals that are actually super shedders. Now we haven't done this at the moment because our data wasn't sufficient, uh, we didn't get enough super shedders to enable us to look at that, but we need to consider that this might be a si the situation and we need to uh, keep our eyes open and, and not just think about identifying certain animals in the herd in which to control this event pre-harvest. So what we need to remember is that this study was performed in a single herd and is subject to variation or lack thereof of weather, um, as we've just discussed. And future research needs to address this. So what we need to do is we need to think about looking at a short intensive study. We've looked at uh, sampling twice a week over a prolonged period of time. But what if that variation, which we've seen to be marked, is actually uh, present at a far finer uh, time period as well. So we need to think about uh, looking at a reduced time interval. So that is um, perhaps sampling <coughs> twice a day over a shorter period, such as two weeks, to th see what uh, is likely to occur here. We would love to repeat this longitudinal study that it, uh, in, in a population that allows identification of risk factors for super shedding. Uh, and unfortunately, this population looked as though it would on initial pilot uh, studies. It looked like it had a, rather a number of super shedding. But as usual, when you start to study a disease, it's the quickest way to get rid of it. Um, and unfortunately, the super shedders dropped out fairly quickly. We'll also go ahead and uh, look at an expert opinion exercise and do some simulation modeling that allows us to include information on within animal variation 
variation. Uh, in previous models that have been uh, published in the literature that have not considered the fact that uh, shedding of O157 varies within animal as well as between animal. Um, and we're also going to try to assess the likelihood of identifying positive animals uh, and the likelihood of identifying super shedders if they truly exist in the population given, uh, given our sampling techniques and sampling methods. The last part of this study will be um, dissemination of results through a national forum, forum and discussion about control at a pre-harvest level, which is incredibly important and the whole reason for doing this based on the fact that uh, we do have that port of entry testing that we want to try to keep um, as clean as possible. So just fi some final acknowledgements and very importantly I'd like to acknowledge my PhD student Geraldine Lemers who is, who is an author on, on this uh, for all her hard work in collecting the data and, and analysing it. Thanks very much.